Psalm 90, verse 10, if you want to jot that verse down so that you'll know where it's stemming from. As I say these words, Psalm 90, verse 10 says this, The years of our life are 70, or even by reason of strength, 80. And what the psalmist is saying there is that, well, the average life could be around 70 years, or maybe 80 if you're really strong. So let's just throw that out here. It doesn't mean I don't want anybody getting nervous if you just had your 70th birthday. (laughs) Because it's all about what God is doing. It's all about what He has got planned for you. But I just needed to throw something out there. What could we use as a measuring rod? And so since the psalmist said that in Psalm 90, verse 10, we're going to go with it for just a few minutes. 70 or 80 years, just that that lifespan that we might imagine living if there's nothing uh, that happens prior to that time uh, that ends our tenure on this earth. 70 years, I did a little calculation, is uh, 25,550 days. 25,550 days. 80 years is uh, 29,200 days. Got these days, we're told the psalmist in Psalm 139. Every one of them known intimately by God before there was a single one, two of our several ten thousands of days. We spent right here in this place, and if we would let him, what he would do here over two little days could affect maybe the next 5,000 days, maybe the next 10,000 days. Because what the Word of God would tell us, and we know this from human life, we know this just from the world, uh, we would not have to have our Bibles to know this, that there is an arrival time and there is a departure time. The difference is the Word of God tells us that He knows exactly when it is. He knows exactly when our arrival will be and exactly when our departure will be. Jesus even said in the Gospels, listen, with all your worry and stress, you cannot even add a day to it. So just trust me on it. This stretch of time given to us. That between this arrival and this departure, we have infancy that usually covers anywhere from the birth through the first couple of years. And then we have childhood, these two, that we'll really address tonight. Then we have, I guess you know where this is going with adolescence. And then if you think about this as our just a representation of departure, I want you to think of it as something something sacred and not something morbid right now. Something sacred that in between this time is this thing we call growing up. Growing up. And to grow up well to grow up well. I did a little research about what happens after conception, and what I love about it is that so far, no matter what kind of medical advances have been made, they still cannot tell whether a woman is expecting a baby right at first in those first couple of days. Only God knows. Don't you think it's a beautiful thing that he reserves the right to be the only person in the universe that knows you even exist if there's this little secret, and it's just his, and nobody else knows it. You know what else I found out? That on day 18, that heart goes boop, boom, 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 out of nowhere, out of nowhere. 17 days after conception, suddenly, right at day 18, or maybe a little bit of variance either way, boom a heart starts beating. At the three-week period, I want you to look, if you've got a pen in your hand, I want you to look at the end of your pen because at the end of three weeks, you would be the size of the end of your pen. Heart beating. Precious. Sacred to God. Mom probably figuring it out by now. I want every single one of you in this room to just put your sweet little hand right on your neck, and I want you to feel your pulse. Feel it? You alive? (laughs) 
As long as you have got a pulse, you have got a purpose here on planet Earth. No matter how old you are, no matter how long you've been, no matter where you think, listen, I've done my thing, I'm retired now. This is not about what the world does with uh, vocation and work. We're talking about the things of the faith. And we're going to learn in the scriptures that we are not grown up. We are not fully grown. We're going to be grown up when we go up. Anybody hear what I'm saying to them? So this whole process, this is going to be the beauty of it. The way that you and I will stay in the game all the way through until we're out of here is that we see it as a continuous process of growing up in him, growing up in him, learning, experiencing, ministering being ministered to, serving, also knowing how to be served. That's what we're talking about. We're at this stage with my youngest grandchild, Willa. She is just under six months old, and we are absolutely bonkers over her. I mean bonkers over her. It had been such a, a stretch of time. Her big brother is 10 and her big sister is 7. And then we got this little tiny thing that we all just stare at and we just pass around from person to person. I'll never forget when I asked Amanda when she was a couple of weeks old, I said, where does she take a nap? Do you usually keep her downstairs or does she go in her bed? And I saw her look over at Curtis and I realized that baby had not been laid down yet. And I thought, well, <laughs> yes. This is what happens with number three. Does anyone know? Does anyone know what I'm saying? So we're just beginning. She's been having some solid food for right about a week and a half now. Just a little bit of oatmeal, just a little bit of food. And what I can tell you is that really she swallows very little. She's mostly spitting it out. And see, that's what happens in our infancy. I want to say to you out of 1 Peter 2.2, 2, it says like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up to salvation. I just want to say something to all of us. Listen, milk's good. It's how you get started. Fundamentals. People ask me all the time, what should I start with? The Gospels, Jesus. If you're, if you're coming into a study of the Word of God and you think, what, what, what am I supposed to do here? I mean, do I just like open it up and, and then just like land on the page and I'm in a book I cannot even say? You want to get to that Habakkuk. You do. You want to get to Obadiah. But you don't want to name your son that. I mean, if you did bless you, and I know he's wonderful. And... I guess you call him Oba. I don't know. <laughs> but I'm just saying that if we're going to, since we're believers, this side of the completed canon, and we are called in Christ, that that, that, that is the basis of our salvation, that we have come to know Jesus Christ. That's where we want to begin. If I really want to know him, then I'm going I'm to go to the Gospels. Teach me about Jesus. I want to know about Jesus. And then I want to know what else the New Testament says about him. And then I want to know what else does the Old Testament say leading up to him. What was the history? What is the redemption story? Start with Jesus and then start going west and east of that place. And you just watch the shadow of Jesus fall all over the Old Testament and then all over the New. And from Genesis to Revelation, you have a gorgeous, progressive revelation of the redemption story that is brilliant beyond imagination. But I just want to remind you, if you're an infant in Christ, praise God for milk. Just praise God for it and start with it, and long for it. Listen, what we don't want is for our, our newborn in Christ, uh, their first syllables to be eternal damnation. It's just not, I just, I just don't think those should be the first six syllables, eternal damnation. I just don't, I don't know, I just don't think that, that somehow just does not See, the thing about infancy is they're really only getting a taste of what you're feeding them. What are they tasting? This is what I want to say to us, not just as, as uh, parents in any way, in any way that we are in any kind of place of influence over young believers. Are our infants in Christ getting to taste and see that the Lord is good, that the Lord is good? 
What are they tasting from us? What taste of Jesus do they get from our lives? What might happen globally if a group of us really began to fervently pray? What might happen if we made it our goal to seek what Jesus wants for this world and for His church and for us individually above what we want? I tweeted these exact words last year and asked if anyone wanted to join me for a concentrated month of guided prayer. The participation was overwhelming and people continue to share how impactful it truly was. In response, we at Living Proof Ministries are so excited to offer this resource in a printed journal format. It's a 31-day guided approach that couples prayer with scripture, and no combination under heaven is more powerful. This journal walks through a seven-fold approach for daily prayer and includes a world map to intercede for people groups around the globe. You are about to have 31 life-changing, prayer-rearranging days with Jesus. Let's align our prayers as much as possible with Christ's priorities, you can have an immensely effective prayer life. I can't think of anything better. The days we're living in call for increased faith. We've seen countries fall, people groups oppressed, individuals going hungry and Christians being persecuted. As a Christ follower, I feel an urgency to pray specifically for these brothers and sisters in the faith. While we may not be able to go to these specific places spread across our globe, the voice of the martyrs is going and advancing the gospel at any cost. Right now they're on the ground ministering to people in closed countries by responding to persecution, by providing Bibles and resources for frontline workers. Would you consider partnering with the Voice of the Martyrs to pray for our persecuted Christian family? Visit their website and sign up to commit to pray for a frontline worker. When you commit, you'll also receive a subscription to their monthly magazine along with a bonus copy of the book Hearts of Fire. Please join me today. We believe that the Word of God is living and active and sharper than any double-edged sword. That Jesus Christ came in the flesh to seek and to save the lost. And we have come to testify that this Jesus still transforms lives, still sets captives free, heals the brokenhearted, defends the oppressed, revives the souls of the weary and renews our anxious minds. You and I have been called to freedom. In a world inundated with bad news, there's good news. Discover hope and joy in the scriptures. Come and find community. And worship the King. Experience generations of women opening the Word of God. Come with us to Living Proof Live. Join us in a city near you. I want you to see this because we're going to move from infancy over here to childhood. And if we're going to look at a childhood, I really felt like God was locking us in to 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 1. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli. And the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no frequent vision. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his own place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. I want to give a little bit of explanation uh, for the lamp of God um, not having gone out yet. This would have meant that it was prior to daylight because what we are told in the scriptures, and I'm going to give you a, a place where you can go uh, look this up. This would be in Exodus 27, 21. The priests were to light a lamp from evening until morning. So if the scripture is telling us the light had not gone out yet, it was not yet uh, quite near dawn. So here is Samuel laying there like right, right before the ark of God. And we're thinking, what, what in the world? I just want you to imagine this. Verse 4, then the Lord calls Samuel and he said, here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, here I am for you called me. But Eli said, I, I did not call. Lie down again. So he went and lay down. Verse 6, and the Lord called again, Samuel. And Samuel arose and went to Eli. He didn't run this time. It's just like now he's just going back into Eli. Like, why, why are you calling me? Here I am for you call me. But he said, I, I did not call my son. Lie down again. I love it because this time he uses an endearment. 
so that Samuel probably, I'm, I'm guessing, perhaps because he did not want Samuel to feel silly for coming into him, but son, I, I'm not calling you. It's not me. Verse 7, Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time, and he arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. And then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the young man. This is, in Hebrew, that is boy. Therefore, Eli said to Samuel, Go lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant here. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. And the Lord came and stood calling as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, speak for your servant hears. And this is the way we have a, a leaning to do, especially when we're young, that we're always going to run to somebody else. And then we begin to figure out, somebody begins to advise us. I believe the Lord's calling your name. I'm going to tell you something. I feel like one of the most important things God wants to do among us this particular night is to remind us what we have meant to him every single moment of our lives. That he knew you were coming before time began and that every single second of your life has been sacred to him. Even if you do not know him, Samuel did not know him personally. He's watching over that boy. He came to a place where he called that boy's name. I'm going to tell you something to so many of us in here. A grown up bears an almost joyless connotation. It's, it's about juggling bills to us. It's about trying to stay employed. It's about constantly setting an alarm that goes off while you're dead asleep. Maybe you just got to sleep. It's scrambling to work. It's going back and forth from, from this place to that, getting things done. If you're, in, uh, if you're parenting or in childcare, it's picking up this one, dropping off this one. It's constant carpooling. It's coming home after an extremely busy day to a miserable mess and thinking somebody needs to pick it up. I hope we're going to get a new perspective that, that may ease the angst of those realities. And those are realities. But there's another reality you got to know. And for just a couple of minutes, I want you, would you just please go here with me for a minute? I want you to remember being a kid. You were one. You sat in something like a high chair. You were also really, really, really cute when your first little teeth came in down there in the gums. You were precious to him. You were sacred to him every minute of it. You know, I got to say this to you. If, you. if you know Jesus personally, do you realize that somewhere along the way, just like Samuel, but with, with something beyond what physical ears can hear, do you realize that if you know Jesus, you actually heard him call your name? I looked up what it means to be called in the scriptures in the New Testament. I said, did he call this one or he call that one? And I realized when it came right down to it, it means this. If your name is Kimberly, Kimberly, that's what it means. <laughs> called. <laughs> called. Just like said your name, called you. And the beautiful part of it is you did hear him. If you responded, you heard him. In a wonderful, miraculous sort of way, you're even being here this weekend, even if you know nothing about him at all, don't even know if you're the least bit interested in him. Actually, you have also heard him a wooing, a summoning, an invitation. But if you know him personally, he called out your name. And somewhere along the way, in the moment of your salvation, you went, here am I, here am I. Land on 5.1 with me. Ephesians 5.1 says this, Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. A fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. I want, I want to know, is everybody listening? Because I'm about to say something to you I do not want you to miss. 
And it is not because um, I have got anything of any value to say. It is because I believe this is what God wants to say to us out of these scriptures. And when we set the Ephesians 4, where it tells us to grow up in every way into him, right next to Ephesians 5, 1. I mean, just verses later tells us that we are to live as dearly loved children. Grow up as dearly loved children. Grow up as dearly loved children, that the whole time we're growing up, even if you are 85 years, you are a dearly loved child of God. Here's what I want to tell you tonight, and here's what I'm going to echo to you this weekend until it gets into somebody's bones. Listen carefully. You will never be a mighty woman of God if you do not know that you are a dearly loved child of God. See, oh, I'm going to wait till that lands on somebody. Anybody? Anybody a taker for that? Because here is where this differs. Because you and I get to be children before him all the way through. And in fact, if we are not, this whole thing will be missing such a component that we will never be healthy in our growing up. Because what we're trying to be is women and men of God without knowing that we are dearly loved children. Dearly loved children. You never outgrow being a dearly loved child. How would a dearly loved child behave? <laughs> Listen, a child that knows they're loved, <laughs> they have a confidence that children that aren't so sure do not have. You and I cannot go back and relive our childhoods, but we have a redo with God. Make no mistake about it. What we could do today is say this. I can't go back and live my physical childhood, but I know this. I can become a healthy child of God. I can know I am your child. That every time I lay my head down on my pillow, I sleep right in your presence. You know every single tear that drops from my chin. You know everything that worries me, everything that I'm afraid of. You know the responsibility that weighs on me, all the stress I'm dealing with. You are my father and you dearly Love me as your child. Listen, somebody, I, I want you guys to hear this as, as, as we press into this place. Our perceptions of God need healing so badly. Would anybody in the house agree with that? Our perceptions of God need healing so badly. Do you understand with me all the way through, all the way through of the adolescence of our faith and going all the way over that literally even when we are on our deathbed, we are dearly loved children of God. That would change everything for us. See, we, we think somehow because we had a bully that was an authoritarian in our lives, God is a bully. Because people were supposed to love us and were detached from us. Or they punished us. Or manipulated us. Or they ran. This is one I know somebody is going to resonate with. Anybody just have people that, um, they loved me plenty. But they also, they would just run cold and hot. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Because you have people in your life like that right now. Right now. You don't know when you get home, are they going to be warm toward you or cold? Does anybody in the house know what I mean? That's not God. We're taking all that perception and we're putting it on him. We're saying, I wonder if he feels cold toward me today or warm toward me. I, I wonder who I am to him today. Does he like me today? Is he, does he approve of me today? As we continue to grow up in the harsh realities of life, we continue to grow up in our bill paying and you filed your taxes <laughs> or you filed an extension or you're worried that you didn't. <laughs> Continue to grow up in all the hard places. But have you continued to just grow up as a healthy child of God? Because the most important component of you becoming a mighty, mighty man or woman of God is that you know and all the scrapping out there and when life gets you bloody, it gets you bruised. That no matter what my external circumstances say to me, I am a dearly loved child of my 
God. He cannot be unbiased about me. He cannot detach his heart from me. He is not unhealthy. He does not run hot and cold. I want you to see that Ephesians 4.32 that says just before 5.1, be kind to one another, tenderhearted. It's giving the picture of being a child before God, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. I want to say this tenderly. I'm going to say it passionately, but it does not come with condemnation. I have been here. I know the stronghold of unforgiveness. But I want somebody to know in this house, your unforgiveness has made you old. Do you know we will drop off years? I'm not talking about physically. That'd be a beautiful thing. We'll take that. I'm talking about years of our heart. Just by letting our bitterness and unforgiveness go. Living Proof Ministries would like to send you a thank you gift for your donation. Visit BethMoore.org forward slash donate. Thank you so much for watching today. Man, it is our joy to serve you at Living Proof Ministries. We do not take a single one of you for granted. Click subscribe so that you don't miss a moment of our time together in scripture. We'll see you back on the channel very soon.